Okay, welcome back. <clears throat> um, we've been, uh, the last uh, hour, we've been looking at uh, attitudes, temperament, and behavior. So we unpacked that a little bit, understood what attitudes are, temperament, and behavior. We looked at how negative attitudes affect um, us personally, also how it affects us interpersonally. We looked at how um, the scripture talks about walking like Christ did, um, growing into uh, Christ's likeness. And so we looked at scripture to help us see some of those Christ-like attitudes. Similarly, we looked at temperaments and how we need to be controlled by the spirit so that the fruit of the spirit um, is what is manifested in our lives and um, what is characterized by, uh, by a temperament that is um, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. And lastly, we looked at behavior, how we can align ourselves to what the word brings about, how we can have our behavior aligned to the instructions um, uh, in the word, that the standard for our behavior is the word. And it is the love of God that actually shows us um, uh, th lo the love of God is shown through our obedience um, in what is said in his word. And thus we, um, we uh, move and transform into that. Now, uh, we, the next, uh, next part, we are just going to be uh, focusing on this part of it, the transformation. How do we transform ourselves into this uh, being Christ-like, um, being uh, uh, having a, t a temperament that's controlled by the spirit and a behavior that's aligned to the word of God. So how do we make that transition? Apologies, sorry. Yeah. Okay, how do we make that transition from, um, from that which is, you know, very carnal into that which is spirit controlled is what we're going to look, look at, okay? Uh, and that, and this will be found um, in page 59 and uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, the, in the book, it's at page 57, okay? So um, uh, what we do see and from, from what we've, we've discussed this far is that God calls us to have a change or uh, a different attitude that, that, is, that shows the attitude of Christ, a different temperament, as well as a different behavior. And that's what God has called us, called us to be in. So remember that all of us are at the same place. We begin at the same place. Um, so, you know, it, it's not as if some are better than the other. We are all sinful, okay, and are all of this, the way that we think, the way that we act, the way that we perceive is all um, marred by sin. It is it, that there is a lot of flaw in the way that we, where, that uh, these things are there. So because of the experiences that happen to us, we could be hurt. We could be carrying these negative attitudes or emotions inside and then our thinking gets distorted. Our thinking uh, is, is very different from what is expected of us as according to the word, uh, to the to the word, okay. And because of this negative thinking, we get uh, uh, it becomes very cyclical. We are bound to wrong patterns of behaviors, right? Or we get into behaviors that would be um, uh, that could be deceptive, or e even we may get into behaviors that are addictive. So we need to recognize and understand and have insight that. What what is going on within us when it is compared to the standard that God has kept for us in Scripture? Okay, and we want to bring four truths through this um, through this, which all of us can um, uh, can begin to uh, uh, to appropriate in our lives, so that that transformation can take place. Now, out of these four truths, two of it, the first two is already completed. It's already done for us. God has already done this uh, because of the work of Jesus, okay? And he calls us to live out of that work, out of 
in in by by believing and just living out of it the other two is something that we need to do daily it's something that is progressively that we do so let's uh, we'll take that time to understand these four and the more that we uh, um, you know believe about these truths and walk in it and do what it says we will begin to see that transformation that personal transformation from inside out from right from our attitudes from the things that we hold on the way that we experience life the way that we live out our behavior will begin to change okay so um i hope all of you all are with me everyone's with me okay all right good thank you all right so let's look at uh, each of it so the first one is the power of the cross okay the power of the cross so remember the first two what the truths that we are going to look at is something that's already done for us okay so um we know what jesus did for us on the cross okay when jesus died for us on the cross he brought about yes forgiveness of our sin okay forgiveness from sin but with that he also gave us freedom from the power of sin from the dominion of sin and um he also brought about healing not just for our souls uh, for our spirit but also for our soul and our body so the the um power that sin had over us because of what jesus did on the cross for us that power of sin has been broken and so that means we no longer are bound to sin we are no longer slaves to sin okay we'll just read uh, two verses and um, we'll take that from there so isaiah 53 verses 4 to 5 it reads and i'm reading from the book but he endured the suffering that should have been ours the pain that we should have borne all the while we thought that his suffering was punishment sent by god but because of our sins he was wounded beaten because of the evil we did we are healed by the punishment he suffered made whole by the blows he received so because of all that jesus took on the cross endured for us on the cross whatever was supposed to be given to us he has taken away and this is a truth that we need to walk in we need to appropriate it um the the work on the cross has been done once and for all it's done once and for all and we all are aware of it now we know that there is no more power or hold that any work of sin has in our lives it doesn't have a hold over our lives we are no longer doing what sin wants us to do because we have we have overcome sin and we have overcome the power of sin because of what jesus did for us on the cross because he defeated um the work of the enemy defeated the power of sin for us okay so let's read uh we we read uh, isaiah 53 4 5 let's just look at roman 6 um uh, verse 6 and 14 verse 6 and we know that our old being has been put to death with christ on his cross in order that the power of the sinful self might be destroyed so that we should no longer be slaves of sin so the power of our sinful self has been destroyed so that we do not have to be slaves of sin sin must not be your master for you do not live under law but under grace okay so what do we see here is that um because of what jesus has done he has already granted complete wholeness to each one of us this also includes every kind of hurt or pain or abuse or wounds that we would have uh carried carried uh, emotionally because of our experiences or uh, situations so right now we see ourselves healed and whole through the cross of jesus christ because he broke the power of sin because he put to death 
uh, uh, put to death the power of sin. The, the, he destroyed the power of sin. So what does that mean? That means that there none of the sin behavior or a sin lifestyle has a power over us or has control over us. So whenever um, you know we we begin to to think or 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 see that a certain pattern or a certain habit is coming over us, we appropriate what God's done and we see ourselves as free because of the power of cross. So everything that Jesus did for us, provided for us, is something that we need to appropriate. We claim that. We claim that as his provision for us, and we walk in the freedom uh, of it. Okay. And so what have the, when we're looking at the power of the cross, we also see that the cross also is, uh, um, when we look at the cross, we see forgiveness. We see the way that he forgave us. So the cross again for us again becomes a place where we need to extend our forgiveness, maybe to those who have wronged us in different areas of life. Okay, and as a result of why we may be in the place that we are in, nevertheless, when we look at the cross where we have dominion over the power of sin, we also look at the cross for a place where forgiveness was extended to us. And so we extend that same forgiveness to those who have wronged us. Because we have been forgiven by him, we have been given grace. And, and you, will rem uh, you will remember the parable of the merciful servant, right? The unmerciful servant, where he, where he uh, is forgiven for his debt by the master, but goes and finds another one of his friends and uh, demands uh, that, that he pay back. And when he doesn't, puts him, you know, does not show him any mercy, does not show him any grace, and puts him into a place of punishment, right? And so we, uh, so from what he did receive, he was not able to appropriate that same, uh, that same grace to someone else. So when we look at the cross, we know that we have been forgiven. And we appropriate that and forgive others who may have wronged us and give the grace that they that, that God has shown unto us. Okay, not because they may deserve it, not because we can give it, but because we walk in the full fulfillment of what Christ has done for us. Okay, so that is what we see in the first one: the power of a cross, something that's already done. So, even how do we apply this? So let's say um, uh, maybe certain attitudes or certain um, um, certain certain uh, 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 behavioral patterns that we see that are that are sinful maybe every time that we feel upset or we we feel angry we cope in a very in through an addictive measure through an addictive behavior right maybe some form of addiction and we sit back to think of what of how Christ has taken away all of that which has, which has, uh, which has binded us, which has bound us, right? All that which which has bound us, and we see that how Christ has taken it, taken it away, which means that He has loosed the power of that addiction over our lives. He's broken those chains. Away. He's lo loosed the power, which means it doesn't have the power to hold us anymore. Which means we walk in freedom. So to appropriate this truth and live in the freedom from the power of sin uh, uh, over us. Okay, so that's the that's the first one. The second comes here: yeah, our identity in Christ. What is our identity in Christ? Now, once we are born again, okay, we we know that we have come into a union with the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's a spiritual union. So we are in Christ and we are in him by the power of the Holy Spirit. So when we believe in Christ, when we, when we give our lives to him, we become, the old passes away and the new comes. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, the old is gone and the new has come. So as new, whenever something is new, everything has changed. Everything about has changed. We don't work the same old way, right? Like think about um, 
uh, the example that I can think or think about is let's say you know some electrical equipment that you have that's not working properly, right? But then you're given a brand new motor, right? Maybe the equipment has been given a brand new motor or a, whatever a motherboard, whatever it has, it's been given a brand new one, and it the old is no more there, even though the cover of that equipment or whatever appliance you're using may be the same the inside has been changed. So the old is gone and the new has come, which means our identity or our nature, who we are, uh, is has also changed. And it is the identity we take up is not the identity of sin and the identity of darkness and the identity of, uh, uh, um, you know, of, of, of whatever, that's that's held us back but our identity is in christ so we are empowered we are blessed and we begin to appropriate this truth that who we are in christ is who we we really are so once we have um, come to that place of appropriating what god's done for us we need to live out of that identity we need to live out of that resource in Christ. So, um, uh, a common example that that's you know often used um, when we talk about identity is think of a of a um, maybe a child uh, who who was living in the slums or living you know in a very impoverished uh, uh, society or impoverished place, and there is someone who comes, a person who has wealth, takes him, adopts him, and brings him to his home a big palace, lots of food, good clothes, big rooms, lots of toys, uh, lots of opportunities to learn, so many things, right? And uh, the only way that this child, this adopted child, can, uh, can begin to enjoy what the rich man has is by actually making a choice to, um, uh, to identify himself as a person of that household, right? That they begin to, you know, take away the old clothes and identify by putting on something new, uh, not going and eating scraps, but ensuring that they sit on the table with the kind of spread that's there, or um, not uh, not moving back into maybe a lifestyle that he's lived, but enjoying the lifestyle. So that's that's something that they they take, you know. So although all of that is made available. Uh, this child needs to live out of that new identity, live out of the resources that are there in that home. So similarly, when we have been bought back, bought when we have been bought with that price of the blood of Jesus and the body um, uh, of, of Jesus through his crucifixion, we live out of whatever he has bought back for us. And when we do that, what happens? The way we see ourselves, our the way we, uh, uh, the confidence we may have, the, our, our self-esteem, all will change. That perspective of who we are changes. We don't look at ourselves as impoverished, um, poor, uh, sinful, but we look, uh, we look at ourselves as bought by the blood of the Lamb. We look, look at ourselves as healed, as redeemed, as victorious, as triumphant, as, um, as channels of his blessing. Right, so our perspective of us changes, and through that, our perspective of other people changes because we begin to see people in the way that God sees them. So our perspective of us changes, the way that we look at others changes, the way uh, our own attitudes and our perspectives about life and whatever happens around us changes. Uh, our our understanding about the enemy, about his forces of uh, darkness, all of that changes, and we see everything through the light of what Christ has done through that. Okay, so looking at this, when we walk and and if we are able to live out of these truths, that that the the cross has been powerful and it has helped to break every uh, um, every uh, um, power of sin over our lives and that we do not have to live through that sinful life. And when we know about this, our identity, who we are in Christ, we will begin to live as strong people. We will begin to live as people under, uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit, okay? We will soon begin 
transforming all the things that we think about and that will percolate into the way that we live into our behavior. So we will be transformed in our um, in our daily living as well. Okay. Now the next. Okay. Is are there any questions here before we move into the next two? And there any questions? Okay. The class has been very quiet today. I don't think I've heard even one voice other than scripture reading. Okay. All right. Thank you, Rin. All right, so let's look at the third and the fourth one. The third and the fourth one is, like we said, is ongoing. It's something that we need to keep doing. The third one we're going to look at is the renewing of our minds. The renewing of our minds is uh, renewing is to to and to make new, which is to alter or change the way that we are thinking and the way that we are seeing things. Okay, So when we renew our minds um, with the word of God, we are replacing those sinful, negative thoughts, attitudes, ideas with what God says in his word. Okay, So when we renew our mind, we are replacing everything or all that we think of, which is, which is um, negative or which is sinful and taking on the a truth of God's word. And the more that we, our minds are renewed, we will begin to see our lifestyle undergoes that change. Okay, The more that, like for example, the more that um, um, maybe someone who you're thinking of who you are probably very angry or upset about, the more that uh, you know you begin to see them in the way that God sees them, the more you will find that your behavior to them also changes. right? So our thinking, once our minds are renewed, it will definitely move into um, transformation about the way that we live out, okay? So so for our minds, if our, if we want our minds to be renewed, the way it needs to be done is to to constantly meditate on God's word, constantly meditate on God's word, and keep our thinking aligned with the word of God. Okay. So here, what we are doing is every time, let's say, anger about that person comes up, we are choosing to think uh, in a way that aligns to God's word. Okay. So maybe it's. Initially, it's just a place of forgiveness. God, bring bring my heart to forgive this person, right? So we're choosing to do as per what God's word, God's word says. Okay, or let's say there are circumstances that happen, or situations that happen, that are um, uh, very contrary to what we see uh, in God's word, but we begin to perceive that from the perspective of God's word. Okay, So every time something happens, we say, all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. Right? We speak peace into, into, the, into that situation. So this continues to be an ongoing process. This is something that all of us need to do at every time possible. Because it's only when we have um, a change of mind, a renewed mind, can we have a lifestyle that is transformed, that is changed. So a renewing of our mind takes place by meditating on God's word, by constantly uh, learning and, and uh, ensuring that we live accordance to his word. So we challenge ourselves. That maybe there is deceit in our, in our uh, uh, minds. And, and God's word says, you know, love. There may be mistrust in our mind. God says to let go and be still and know that he is God. There may be anger in our minds. God says, forgive. There may be sadness in our minds. God says, be joyful and rejoice because he is your strength. So the more that we keep our minds renewed you know, constantly, we will begin to see the transformation even in our lifestyle. The fourth one is walking in the spirit. Okay, now 
uh, not just renewing our minds, but also we are called to walk in the spirit. Now, what does that mean? Walking in the spirit means we submit to the Holy Spirit. We yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit, which means that we are being very keen to hear his voice, to hear where he is guiding us. Okay, We are also at the same time learning to understand what is it that pleases the Holy Spirit and what, <laughs> excuse me, and what is it that grieves the Holy Spirit? Okay, we we are coming to a place where we submit and allow Him to take over everything <clears throat> of us, to take over the, our thoughts, our deeds, our words, and allow Him to work in our lives. Okay, so uh, it, it, with, when we are walking in the Spirit we are yielding ourselves to the Holy Spirit so that he works through us. He, his, his will, his desire is manifested through us. His guidance, his leading happens through us. Okay. So when we begin to walk in the Spirit, what are we doing? We are also building someone else up spiritually. Okay. We are, con we are in that place of uh, of uh, um, communing with God, okay. We are continuously in that place where we where we speak to God, where we are communing with Him, and then we we begin to walk in that place of uh, obedience and humility towards Him. Okay. So when we when we do walk in the Spirit, what are we not doing? We are not walking in the flesh. Okay. When we walk in the Spirit, both of this cannot reside together. So when we walk in the spirit, we uh, uh, Galatians 5.16 says, when you walk in the spirit, you are not fulfilling the lust of the flesh. Okay. So what is the lust, lust of the flesh or the desires of our body? It's that fighting or quarreling, getting angry, having hatred, maybe abusing, saying things that are, that are not right. All of that is classified under the words of the flesh. So when the Holy Spirit uh, when we walk uh, in the Holy Spirit, we are all, we put uh, we, what we're doing is we're putting an end to everything that comes out as a result of the flesh. So when we walk in the Spirit, we are also putting an end to the work of the uh, of the flesh, the lust of the flesh. And instead, because when we're walking in the Spirit, the more the fruit of the Spirit becomes expressed in our lives. Okay. So uh, when we look at uh, uh, how do we have transformed lives, it is through two things where we, where we have a completed work of Christ, the power of the power of the cross, our identity in Christ, and two things that continue happening is to be able to walk in the spirit and to renew our minds by the meditating of God's word. Okay. So in in the time that we relate to our spouse, okay, we we relate to them, keeping in mind or maintaining these Christ-like attitudes, the spirit control temperament, and this behavior when we are relating to them, because uh, we do see also the way that Christ, um, uh, uh, the the relationship of Christ to the church, was in in a way that. Um, that, that is that which we need to model, okay? that we need to relate to our spouse the way that Christ has related to us in forgiveness, in patience, in endurance, in love, in, um, in respect, um, all, all of that that we learned the last, last week about the roles of a husband. Okay? So uh, it's important to come again to a recognition of of where we are and what is it that we need to change so that um, our thoughts, our, our understand our perceptions, our behaviors, the way that we communicate are aligned to what God wants. And so by doing that, we are in a better place to understand uh, what how your, the spouse is thinking or how they are perceiving or how they're acting or how they are responding. Okay.
So um, I've, I've come to the end of that of, of this section. Uh, if there are any thoughts, any opinion, any any observations, any questions, uh, it's a good time to check now. We have around fifteen minutes for you to be able to do that. Or anything that you feel you've learned that's been helpful for you, uh, also, you know, you could share that. Anybody? It's a very silent class today. Okay, so maybe I I'll, I have a question for you, okay? And um, would like to see how well, you know what what you feel or what what you can what you think or what how how we could respond. Now, um, suppose um, um, suppose you know as a, as a married couple. Um, you know, you you may be witnessing, or you may have a spouse who's probably in a place of uh, complaint, right? That they are, uh, uh, or, or you may see a negative attitude or a behavior or a response um, um, that that is not Christ-like. Okay, how would you mm, how would you respond? To a person or to a spouse who's uh, who's probably keeping one of these negative attitudes, or there is a negative attitude or behavior that they are uh, manifesting, uh, how would you like to help them, or how would you like to talk to them? What would you what would you do? Okay, now this is a question, okay? So I'd like you to think about it and what, how can you, what could you do? Hello, students. Okay, now I'll, have, I'll be forced to call out people's name. Okay, so Anthony says you will keep praying about it. Okay, that's a that's a good thing to do. Uh, Rin says I can be tolerant and encourage and help to see the many things that we can be grateful for. Okay, all right, good. Anything else? So we can actually come up with 14 answers because there are 14 of us here on the call. And we've got just two out of 14. Um, may, may I speak? Is it OK? To sure, sir. Go to ahead. Yeah. Yes. No, I said we can uh, probably bring it to the attention of the spouse that so and so such a thing is there. and. Uh, strictly speaking, it should be that, I mean, they, I mean, they would also need to be. But the question is, if there is something, right? Uh, the question is, yeah. once again, yes. the question is, in case you observe a uh -huh. negative attitude or a negative behavior in your spouse, that, that they may not be uh, aware that, that it is one or, you know, it's affecting uh -huh. them, what would you do? Yeah. So one is to yeah to really to to bring it to it to the notice of the spouse that uh, this is what's been happening or it would be good if you're able to deal with it or handle with it. At the same time, also keep praying. I mean, it may not. It's possible that it will just not change so quickly, or you know, it will just not happen just overnight like that. But then uh, we, in the meanwhile, can 
continue, I mean, the, the other person who's bringing it to the attention, whichever it could be either way, right? So um, could continue to keep praying mm -hmm. and uh, or hoping that, uh, you know, uh, the spirit, God will really work on mm -hmm. that particular attitude and uh, change it. Mm -hmm. Uh, but uh, then the uh, uh, the it's it's important that the other person continues to display all the characters. I mean, which what what we were just learning. Mm -hmm. It's about constantly renewing your mind or working the spirit so that mm -hmm. the other person is encouraged to make those required changes. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. I think there's there are other people who've written. Uh, Anand says, I'll sit and speak and pray for her. Um, uh, Rin says, make sure that it does not become an issue by helping him adapt. Nina says, uh, Nina Santosh says, bring it before the Lord. And if they're open for corrections, talk to him with love. Uh, yeah, I think uh, uh, Jackin said, choosing not to react immediately, but respond in kindness and humility, keeping on loving and forgiving. The spouse seek God's help and wait for God to speak to him. Okay, wonderful, right? So, in a in a marriage where two people are growing together, um, it's it's good to get into a practice of where you hold each other accountable. You know, when you be when you are on the journey of being Christ-like, um, it's it's always good to have someone. Uh, observe and and give you certain feedback you know it really helps uh, in, in you know in any walk of life and whatever we're doing when someone is observing us is far better than when we evaluate and assess ourselves so it's a good thing especially it's ideal for a couple who are willing to grow together so being holding each other accountable is a good thing now sometimes we know that that's that probably doesn't always happen. But um, uh, when we're bringing correction or when we are pinpointing something, I think a good principle is always to first and foremost share what you see is Christ-like in them. You know, always pinpoint what you've seen as Christ-like in them, that you know, they may be selfless, they may be loving, they may be kind, they may be generous, whatever. Uh, and there may be so many things that you can pinpoint and say, you know, this is what I see. And also then to lovingly, gently, not being judgmental, bringing up uh, the point of issue okay, uh, to them and placing it there uh, and doing it with, with that understanding that, uh, you know, like, like for example, maybe, uh, you know, the same example I had given you earlier, maybe, you know, of the money and, and two people, maybe the person who is more frugal, who is more, um, uh, uh, you know, tight fisted may have had a bad relationship with money you know, because of whatever reason. So saying that with an understanding that, you know, I, I do see or I do sense where this may be coming from that it may be difficult uh, for you because this is what you've seen. Nevertheless, uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I was wondering how we could work on this together or, you know, the, the way that the Bible tells us to be generous or to be, uh, to, to look into the needs of others, whatever, uh, right? To, to be able to do it in a way where you're not letting the other person feel that there's a fault finding and you're doing some kind of moral policing over their lives but actually engaging with them uh, to work together on that. And, um, and of course, yes, to continue praying, to continue to declare that over them. And especially if, if you do find that the spouse doesn't take it well, it may be good to, uh, to step back and keep, keep praying and bring it up. Maybe not every day, not every time, but you know, once in a while when the incident has probably blown out of proportion. So being accountable to one another really helps. Uh, um, uh, finding the positives or finding the things that's actually aligned to the word of God, that really helps. And bringing this as a feedback where you're doing it lovingly, gently, without, uh, a, without uh, judgment and with understanding of that background. And uh, helping and saying that we could work this together 
and also continuously pray. Okay, excellent, wonderful. That's good. All right. Any any thoughts? Anything that um, any of y'all have a question? If so, we could respond uh, to that question. Any any question? Any thoughts? Any learnings? Okay. Okay, I suppose not then. So, um, <laughs> okay, it'll be good if we, I ask you the question. Okay. Um, yeah, but do you all have any questions as in the sense of a doubt or things like that? Um, no, okay, I don't think so. All right. Um, yeah, I think uh, you know we we've covered that when I, when I asked you that question, it would mean in all three areas: the attitudes, the personality, and uh, the the uh, behavior. So I was just thinking, um, you know, especially when you may see a behavior that's negative, right? Um, and I think we've seen this many times in marriage. So I'm just bringing about a question here. Let's say you observe a certain behavior of your spouse that is quite negative, and um, maybe let's say they use bad language, okay? In their anger or in their frustration, they use bad language. They're a believer. Um, uh, or, but when, when they're really angry or agitated, some bad words fly out. Okay, and uh, as a spouse, you've done the gentle talking, the loving talking, uh, you've done all of that. Uh, and then at some point of time, you decide, okay, it's time to get somebody else involved. Okay, I'll involve somebody else to speak to my spouse. And often I've seen this involving someone else would be without the knowledge of the of the of the other spouse. It's not in the knowledge. And they'll call and say, you know, this is what my husband and my wife does. Please can you correct? And if it is a if it isn't a mindful minister, you know, the next time they say they'll say, you know, your wife called and told me this. That's not the way. Okay, so this, that's a scenario. What are your thoughts um, about that? I've asked you a question now. Then. What are your thoughts? How should we go about something like this? Like you're saying, you've done all of this. You know, you've done the talking, the gentleness, all of that, and you're getting frustrated. And you decide, okay, I'm going to call maybe a minister of God or a man of God or a woman of God to correct my my spouse without the permission or without the spouse knowing. What do you, what do you sense of that approach? Okay, I'm awaiting some answers or some thoughts. Rin, do you have a thought? It's not to put you on the spot, Rin. But uh, anybody, anybody else. Uh, what if it did not go as intended? Yeah, so it did not go as intended, which means, let's say, the, the spouse got very upset. Uh, OK, so I think someone said, uh, Shivakumar says, that attitude worsens the situation. OK, uh, we should pray more fervently for our spouse and not approach someone without the knowing of our spouse. OK, all right. Any other thoughts? OK, so. 
Um, often, you know, I, I think we, we need wisdom when we're doing this, is that um, maybe the person that we are enlisting for support may not even be a person that our spouse relates well with, right? If it is, uh, um, uh, uh, they, if they don't relate well with them, suddenly someone comes in. Like, like for example, you know, you see someone in church, and you know, uh, and and suddenly their spouse calls you and say, "Please correct this person because this, this, this." Right? Uh, remember that a lot of um, correction, rebuking, encouragement comes on the basis of a relationship. It comes from a relationship, and any. If if you just if someone just admonishes someone, um, uh, you know that that may that may that may cause significant problems back in the marriage, right? So to do things with wisdom, one is maybe first discussing with the spouse of how a certain behavior or a certain attitude seems to be extremely negative and would like that it be worked on, making suggestions. Would you like to get help or speak to somebody about it? That would probably be uh, the next step. Uh, and also, uh, and, and so if then there is an agreement, allowing that person, the spouse, to reach out to someone on their own accord so that they can get that help. OK? So yeah, Nina, you're right. We, you can't change anybody that easily without their own will. So doing things on the sly behind their backs can often cause a lot more of damage than what you what you may intend to do okay so it is with wisdom that you deal with a situation like this okay that's good all right okay if there aren't any questions we'll close today's uh, session uh, is there someone who can please close with a word of prayer can i ask one of the students uh, to pray. Students at the Bible College, all of you who gathered there, any one of you, would you all please close with a word of prayer? Mm. Uh, can someone please pray from the Bible College students? OK, anybody else? If not for the students, anyone else, please? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. Anand, go ahead. Or whoever is there on that call, go ahead. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this day, we thank you for this time, for this class that we've had. And, uh, and Lord, we are so grateful that we get to learn some things, especially about us, those who are not married yet. And um, I thank you, Jesus, that um, you are helping us to transform ourselves, to change ourselves, and to live a lifestyle that's pleasing to you. And uh, thank you, Lord Jesus, that um, uh, that we uh, that we have this opportunity to learn and to grow in your word, and we thank you for this day. In your name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, friend. Thank you all so much. God bless you. We'll meet again next week. Thank you. Bye bye.